Okay, we are live. Hello, I'm Robert Lenti with uh, Course Create Consulting, and this is our live streamcast show, our little show that we've been doing where we are going to look for customers of online course and learning and development services. We're also going to look for people in the business and the best talent and influencers in the business, so to speak. And I'm really excited about my guest today. I have with me today, um, none other than, and I, I know he's, I'm embarrassing him a little bit, but I do, <laughs> I do, sincerely, do sincerely feel this way about this cat. None other than the Forrest Linden. Look at him. Look at him. Um, I, and I'm not just bloating this. I, this is the way I feel about it. And I've worked with this cat for, I don't know, about a year now. Right, Linden? Um, mm -hmm. Off and on. Um, Forrest is one of the industry's leading consultants and experts um, in regards to all things uh, online courses, all things e-commerce, all things solopreneurship and home business. So um, we have some fun questions for um, Forrest. And um, I just want to approach this by saying that um, I have been a client of Forrest. So I've had first hand experience working with him um, as, as a vendor and also as a part-time mentor, which we're going to get into a little bit as well. And he's just really brilliant. So anyways, Forrest, Thank you for being here. I really appreciate having you. Thanks for having me. Super, super happy. Like it's, I mean, to be honest, we've been chatting for a little bit before you hit live. So yeah. I'm excited that you hit the broadcast button and we can continue our conversation. So <laughs> thanks, man. <laughs> okay. All right. And um, just uh, b uh, b before we dive in uh, real quick, I am... Uh, I just want to do a quick little shout out for a learning management system that that m both of my companies are on. Something uh, a system you guys may have heard about before. It's called Kajabi, and um, it is well, it's one of the best learning management systems uh, out there on the planet. Uh, Forrest himself has actually spent a lot of time working with it and believes in it. Um, I've been through a lot of systems to deliver the courses that I've developed through the years. Many, I, so many, I've lost count. Probably eight or ten. And I will tell you, in all sincerity. The best system I have ever been on, I've ever used to deliver the courses that I create has been Kajabi hands down. It's very intuitive. It's, it's obviously designed for online course creators. So um, if you're looking for a good learning management system, I do recommend Kajabi. There, thank you. All right, and so does, so does Forrest. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> okay, all right, so let's, let's, let's do this. This is gonna be a lot of fun. All right, Forrest, tell us briefly about your current business. Um, fill in the gaps, let people know who you are from your perspective, and yeah, what do you do for folks? Where's the value? Well, I run a business called Clarity Lab, and okay. right now it's primarily focused on two things. One is a curated newsletter they send out um, currently every two weeks called Clarity Lab. Um, and it's really designed for people at this moment, uh, anybody who is working to build a business that's selling knowledge in any format. So knowledge commerce is what I tend to focus on as well as people who are looking to monetize actual newsletters themselves. The scope of the newsletter will eventually broaden to more people running other types of online businesses. But for right now, that's where I'm focused because that's my wheelhouse. So. I, I read a lot of posts and articles and I listen to a lot of podcasts and watch tons of videos. Every couple of weeks I go through and find the best five things uh, that I found in a bunch of different categories. Could be marketing, could be copywriting, could be SEO, technical stuff, um, platforms and tools that I find, interesting news bits. And I just pull the best stuff out of the hundreds of things that I go through and I curate them and I put them in a context and explain to people why they're important to focus on and how it can help their business. And, you know, paragraph for each curated thing. And once in a while I crack a joke and try to make things funny because, you know, online business is generally pretty dry and I think it could use a bit of humor. So, <laughs> and it makes it fun for me to write too. So newsletter, number one push for me right now, also still consulting with people. I have a lot of long-term clients who I help 
where they are building a business that sells either consulting, coaching, or online courses. And what I help them do, I'm essentially, I mean, consulting is really teaching. You're just transferring knowledge. Um, in addition to helping people map out a plan for how to actually implement the things that we talk about to create a successful business that um, allows you to take your work into the world and make an impact and also make really good revenue. There's a, a challenge in the industry where, you know, there's a lot of great marketers around that have courses that will teach you some part of the process of selling online courses. You spend $2,000, you go through the course and you know how to do just one part of 12 things that need to happen and you get out. And this is not to say anything bad about these courses. They, they're focusing what they're focusing on. Like they go through and they buy the product launch formula class and they go through that and they learn how to launch courses. But then you get out and you realize you don't know how to do all the other stuff. You know how to launch, but that's it. So the consulting work that I do is very practical and it helps people just like I jump, I jump in, find out where they're at and we start mapping out a plan based on where they want to get to in three, six, 12 months. And we work backwards from goals to help them map out a strategy for like, okay, here's what you need to do. If you want to launch in September, we got to work backwards. Who do you need to have in place? Who are you going to hire to do this? If you don't have money to hire, how are you going to learn to do it by then? So it's really just focused on the actual reality of what it takes to pull off um, the entire process of starting with an idea and going to profit. And it's a lot of what you do at Course Creek too. Like you guys have a team that, that do, that help people with the entire process as well. I come at it from my own perspective of, you know, we each have our own ways to go about it. So, yeah. So newsletter and consulting for the time being and super excited about that. I got some pretty cool stuff going on with the newsletter in terms of monetization down the road but mm -hmm. focused on audience growth right now. And once it gets up to a critical mass, then I will unleash some monetization strategies to bring even more value for a little bit of money. So, yeah. yeah I, so when you say the newsletter, I, um, I, I want to make sure I'm, I'm clear on this. Uh, it's go to your website, sign up to get the, the, the free sort of, sort of the sequence, the, yep. the education of you know, the value. Um, yeah, and soon it'll be weekly, but right now it's every two weeks. If you go to clarity.lab.co, it's yeah. right on the homepage. You can opt in to sign up to get the newsletter. Yeah. Yeah. So folks, I get a lot of these things and I and I do uh, get forced newsletter. And, um, you know, it, it is really super good. It is really great. And and I'm super short on time for us. But when, but I always just quickly, I'll be honest with you, I don't read it like, I don't like sit down. I don't have time. I'd love to have that luxury, but I do sort of peruse it really quick. And, and it's all on point. It is all on point. And, and he has a way of, because he's really good at copy. He's written copy for me before. And he has a way of sort of like drawing you in, which is what you should do when you're writing a good newsletter. And yeah, because it's valuable, like it's good ideas. Like, hey, here's a tool, here's a tip, here's a thing that'll help you save a few minutes a day. And it's really great, so. Thanks, man, appreciate it. I'm glad that even the skimming of it helps you out a little bit. I used to do 10 things and people would write and it's like, man, this stuff is all so good, but it's too much. Like, I can't yeah. go through 10 things every, every week you're sending this out, so I cut it down. Yeah, yeah, if, it, if there's one, thing you take away from your time watching this little broadcast today um i would i would at least at least do that at least go out to his website and sign up for his newsletter it's so valuable i save them i put them in a folder because <laughs> i'll go back but it's great it's great um yeah and you're right also this point that he makes in regards to um uh that in the industry there's a lot of really brilliant marketers right people with great ideas that are valid ideas but it's it's only like just one piece of the whole puzzle that has to that has to be put together to really get it done and and yeah so it's a valid point so in your opinion then where is the industry going but as online a, teach like the online teaching industry yeah like, yeah or yeah um e-learning in general um where, where do you see it going because you have that sort of that. Yeah, I, I do watch a lot of trends. It's one of the things that I do when I curate is I, I try to pick out patterns that yeah. I notice and like, what are all the big people doing? What are like smaller people who are just starting out? Like, what are they up to? And 
I think there's a trend right now that that's just coming top of mind is there's going to be a, a push towards uh, a blend of traditional online courses where it's self-paced and there might be a weekly call it like let's just there's a lot of different structures you can do but let's say you, you create a six-week course and there's a module per week that gets released and you do a weekly call for your members and where they can basically ask you anything and you don't really do teaching in these calls it's just like uh, people have gone through the content for that week's module at their own pace they get on the call they ask questions that's you know a, a common format and then you add in the community piece there's usually a private community space whether it's inside of a platform like kajabi with your own you know private little facebook group clone that's not on facebook or whether you're using a facebook group or mm -hmm. mighty networks or a circle group um so those things are like a rough combination of what you tend to what that that's what online courses have been for the last 10 years plus 2007 was really kind of the year that things started to take off so if you read enough articles about the stats of how far people make it in online courses that are self-paced it's pretty dismal people don't make it very far which is hard as a course creator because you work just as hard to create the last videos in your course as you do to make the first ones because you care about your content and, and the quality and you're like doing really good work to teach your, your like to transfer your knowledge and most people won't see the last module of your course or the last videos like you can look at the stats and watch how many people make it to the last videos and i'm like oh my god why did i waste all the time making those videos no one's watching them what but that's what happens on online courses like people if they're alone in their house and they're busy and they got a lot going on and they're yeah. trying to learn something on the side they have yeah. a, a job they want to get out of and they want to start selling courses it's their side gig they don't have a lot of time to learn and there's no accountability there's no one sitting in the room with them to like you know urge them on just because everyone else is doing it <clears throat> so what i think is is going to happen some people are starting to do this and i'm getting interested in going back to this as well is that it's a hybrid model of old school learning where it, <laughs> no, it I'm serious. Happens. Like I'm, I'm down. This is it, what happens when you talk into a forest. It's like grab a pen, die for paper, and go. Okay. So, <laughs> what I think is going to happen is that more and more people are going to start teaching live, weekly, where the course materials are sort of a backup. And they're like resources that you can go to if you want to go deeper into a topic. But for the most part, the courses are delivered. I think they're going to be delivered live. So if you run a six week course, the weekly sessions are no longer just like a FAQ, like ask me anything you want after having gone through all of my course materials and videos, the weekly calls become live classes. That's where the majority of the knowledge transfer happens is in a live, in a live class. Everybody shows up. This is when it's happening. It's Friday at 5 PM mountain time. Like you be there. And that's where it happens. Like that's where the magic is. And then, and then you also have the, you know, the um, asynchronous community where people can get support with each other and not be there at the same time. Just to, you know, type out a, a question or an answer, and you go and help people. You as an instructor might be in there and answering questions, just like little things. But you save the big stuff for the live calls. So I think what's happening is there's a trend that people are starting to do is teaching live having materials and resources on the back end to back up their, their live teaching. And then so that you might teach for 60 minutes, give them some exercises and downloadable materials, and then open it up for questions for 30 minutes. So instead of a, a 90 minute, ask me anything, it's 60 minutes of teaching and 30 minutes of ask questions, but there's live learning with people in zoom chatting with each other in the chat box and you have a moderator, answering questions in there who, who directs questions that are coming in from the chat box to you so that wow. while you're teaching, it's essentially like in a classroom when someone raises their hand going, um, Mr. Lunty, I don't understand what you're talking yeah. about. Right. So like it's that, but it's in the chat box, but you as a teacher running a zoom, you know, you can't watch that chat. You'll get super distracted because you got to keep your mind focused on the material that you want to get out. Yeah. Yep. Um, but you got it. So having somebody moderate and we can come back to this because the importance of team building is something that I want to come back to um, because you can't get very far alone running a business like this. You, there's a there's a cap, like a income cap that you can get to. And it takes a lot of sacrifice to get there. I know because I did it um, and we can talk about that later. But having a moderator in those those live classrooms is going to be really helpful. So this I think that's where things are going is a move away from creating a massive amount of content, letting people go through it on their own, 
which they won't for the most part. They'll buy it and they'll get through the first few handfuls of it. But it really takes a lot of like, like self-directed, internally motivated people to get through a, a large amount of content right. on their own. Right. Like think of your, yeah. your singing course. There's what, 250 lessons in there and massive wow. amounts of like, you know, written content. And you got a, like a 600 page book with diagrams. Like who's going to go through that on like not many people plow through that by themselves. It's true. Right. It's, it's true. true. Like it's, and, and that's, and it's not just your course. It's my course. It's my wife's course. It's like anybody yeah. with a, a large amount of content, just people have trouble making it through by themselves. So I think the live stuff will help because then you show up, you're there together, you see the other people in the chat box. It's like, oh, there's 75 people in the class and we're all here together focusing on the same thing. Yeah. And we're like right. chatting out like, hey, howdy from Boulder and like, howdy from Chicago. And you're making connections with people. And there's like this, there's a buzz around live stuff. It's why we're doing a live call today. You combine the buzz of live, live things happening in this moment. You know that I'm sitting in this room right now talking over here in Boulder and you're up there in Idaho and we're chatting and like it's happening now. You do that. You combine that with teaching. It makes it exciting. And there's people in the chat box connecting mm -hmm. with each other. So I think that's a big trend of where things are going is, is a restructuring of how, how the, the teaching happens in an online space. That's just awesome. That is, in some in, in in some sense, it's very simple and almost intuitive. And yeah, you you, you want to say, yeah, of course that makes sense. But then somebody that's in this every day, also, I hadn't really considered it that way. But when I step back and pull up on get some altitude, and I sort of looking at the same industry that you are with some level of experience at this point, and realizing, yeah, you know what, I think he's right on that. This yeah. is why you're a great guest. This is fantastic. <laughs> isn't it? It's good insight. Thank you. Um, okay. yeah, anybody's viewing, that's really fantastic. But there's one question that comes to mind when I hear this. One thing that comes to mind is, okay, that looks like a lovely program for students and helps people get through and it's very high touch. Good. Fantastic. But that's more time. That's more, more time with the teacher, right? So the scalability starts getting a little like maybe it depends on how you structure it if you're already going to do a weekly call yeah but the weekly call was going to be a faq call like a, ask me anything a lot of people that's the structure they're doing weekly calls or every other week if the course is longer so if you're already spending time on a zoom call yeah right okay it's the same amount of time it's just it's like it takes more prep though like it's like it's more mental energy as a course creator oh. It's easier to hop on a call and let people randomly ask you questions. Just like you're you're asking me questions now. I'm just yeah. answering things on the fly. I didn't like I did a little bit of prep, but like really, we're just like hitting the live button and we're going. That's like mentally less yeah. taxing as a yeah. course creator than it is to come with materials prepared for you to go through and teach live. You might have yeah. slides you need to prep, so you're gonna teach with slides and do like a you know what most people call a webinar but it's really just voiceover with slides to teach people with visual stuff and keep it interesting um or you might just teach live talking as a talking head you know i don't i don't really think it's that much more time i think it's a little more cognitive load on the course creator so that to be honest yes it's going to feel like more work but um in the end i think that keeps people more engaged and if you as a course creator have two goals which most people do which is to make money, that's primary. Secondary is to help people change something in their life. They want to make their life better in some way. That's what yeah, almost- you know, You're all right about that. That's yeah. so, so true. If that's true, you don't want to put out a fully self-paced course and just let people like stumble around and get into module two and don't get to module eight, right? You want them to get the full impact of what you're teaching. Of course. So if you teach them live, you're going to help them get through further and get more benefits out of your knowledge. So I've got some phone calls to make today. Um, <laughs> I'm serious. Thank you. That's just great, folks. That is gold. So for everybody, students mostly. Yeah. Okay. So what's the biggest pain point people need and want in terms of when we say people uh, would be course creators, solopreneurs, the, the folks that you and I are working with every day. Um, right. What I have an opinion on that, but we want to know yours. What is a, uh, yeah, so what, what is the big pain point? I think as a as someone new coming into the industry, if you have an idea to sell a, a course, and this is where almost everybody starts, 
you got an idea for a course and you have you bought a URL and that's what pretty much everybody comes with is an idea and a domain name. <laughs> and then and then there's like you start to learn everything else that it takes to get to where you want to go, which is launching a course and making income and helping people, right? Between the between the purchasing of the domain name, which is like the idea spark and selling the course and depositing multiple six figures from teaching people is a lot. You, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, there's a limit that one human has because there are about, I mean, I have to count it again, but there's somewhere around 17 or 18 different roles that you need to play. And if you try to do them all yourself, you will sacrifice every other part of your life, family, friends, workout time, everything gets sacrificed because you're trying to do everything yourself. You're going to do copywriting and you're going to learn to do it. You're going to do graphic design. You're going to learn how to build your website, learning how to put up a, like a Kajabi thing. You're going to create your content, design your curriculum. You're going to create launch materials. You're going to run the launch. You're going to do video editing. Um, and then you're going to take customer support. You're going to teach the class and then you're eventually like, yeah, yeah. No, you're not, you're not, you're not. Well, I did not. it once. I did it once. I went from zero. Yeah. No list, no website. I did everything. <laughs> okay. And in 11 months, I got to six figures by launching a course. Okay. And there's some key things that happened in there that make that possible. That's, that's, but it was like, I sacrificed everything. And there was a period of about two months where I was working 18 hours a day. My family didn't see me. My kid was like three or four at the time, my son. And he, like, it was crushing. He would, I would come in for dinner and then go back out to work. But and then as I leave the table, he's like, Papa, why, why are you working? I want to play. Like, can we go to the park? I'm like, oh, I got to keep working, man. Like, I'm sorry. I'll see you in a few weeks. Like, it was horrible. So I will never do that again. And I would never recommend that anyone try to do this alone. Yeah. So th this points to the fact that you can't get very far. You can't get much past $75,000 or $100,000 a year by yourself selling an online course. It's just not possible. True. So, True. so this speaks to the need to build a team and to have resources to hire to help you at key points along the way. There is always going to be a, um, a choice. It comes down to three options when you're, when you're building things in your business. You're either going to learn to do it yourself and get it done yourself. You're going to hire someone to help you do the thing that you need to get done. Copywriting, you know, building a website platform, helping you with strategy, or you're going to learn, you know, like, again, you're going to learn to do that stuff. And the third option, which is really rare, is that you happen to be in a relationship with someone who has skill sets that can fill in and become a team member without getting paid because they run the business with you, right? Those are the only three options to get a business like this built. So when, like, the biggest pain point that I see is that people jump in and they try to do the first few steps themselves. The very first thing you need to do in most people's minds is get a tech platform set up because you can't do anything online and sell a course without a presence on the web. You need a website, you need a place to house your online courses, you need video streaming, places to put up downloadable files, you need an email platform to communicate with people, just customer support app, like some fundamental pieces of a tech platform. People will try to build that themselves because it's the very first step they think. There's another step that they usually skip, which we'll get back to um, in, a, in a little bit. I have a feeling we're gonna talk about that, but. The biggest challenge is that people need help, which is why people like me and why teams like Course Creek exist. You will hit a point where you'll jump into the software and you'll jump into course um, curriculum design and creating content, and you're going to be like, "Oh my God, there's this is so much work. Yeah. Who do I? Who can I hire?" At that point, the pain becomes so great. I get emails all the time, like, you know, I've got a course on Kajabi. That teaches people how to use the platform, soup the nuts, everything you need to know about it, right? Yeah. I've had people over the years say, look, your your training materials are so crystal clear and it's really easy to follow. But I don't want to be doing, I don't want to build the platform. I want to, I have so much other stuff to do. Mm -hmm. I don't care about the technology this much. Like yeah. there are geeks like me who love playing around with software and like I don't have any problem building this stuff. It's fun. It's like Legos, right? But not everybody's like that. And I'd respect that. When you have a course to teach and you want to help people with make a change in their life, you want to do what you want to do. You got to stay in your like your zone of genius, right? Which is teaching and helping people. 
What do you need to do so that you're the person on stage teaching and transferring knowledge? You need to not do the technology and not do customer support. And there's a whole list of things that you shouldn't be doing. You should not be formatting blog posts. You should not be formatting newsletters, like run down the list and just track all the stuff you're doing to run your business. Like there's so much that you should not be doing that you need to offload. So in, in the beginning, consulting helps getting a team to help you like build the tech platform out, uh, mapping out a plan. You guys even teach people how to you know show up good on video because you're amazing on video. Like your on camera personality is like the best I've seen in the industry. So all that stuff that you guys do is super helpful. And eventually beyond that, you need a team of people ongoing, a small team of virtual assistants, online business manager, um, graphic designers that you pull in as a, on a contract basis, um, people to, you know, edit podcasts or videos, you know, some media editors, like you need a team around you. That's the point that I'm getting at. So, so it goes and it goes on and on. And I, I, I want to say that the experience that, that I have to say, uh, the experience that, Forrest was describing in regards when he was telling the story about how he just went all in to do, try to do everything. And no, you did that too, didn't you? I, know. Well, I, was, I was just, just going to say that I did that yeah. too. I did that too. I, for years and you and I've had a lot of personal conversations and you've been kind enough to listen to some of my commiseration about back in the day, but <laughs> um, yeah, folks, I did that too. And it's yeah. because of that same challenge that, Forrest was describing is is one of the reasons why we launched Course Creek because I I stepped back well if I want to be in the business of online courses and helping people do that what is it that they need I was thinking and I thought well if I look at my personal experience they need help they need people to do some stuff for them you know so that they can just not work how they say it not work on the business but work in the business anyways yeah. Um, I don't want to talk about myself so much, but I just, I'm just underscoring that he's right. So. Yeah. And it's hard. It's like, it's painful to try to run it by yourself and you can't, there's too much to do. So if you try to do it, you're all yourself, you become the bottleneck and you're going to slow everything down. So you either have to have a budget to hire people like yeah. the course three team or other consultants or, you know, um, implementers, or you're going to learn, learn to do it yourself. If you learn to do it yourself, which you can, it's just going to take longer which is fine. Like, you know, some people don't have a budget to hire a big team, but um, that's your, you're going to be faced with that reality. Like the, this is the blunt reality. You hire people to do it faster. So, and then allow you to focus on what you want to do yeah. or you learn to do it yourself and go slower and not spend as much money. It's you're right about that, but I'm just going to be devil's advocate for the moment. Um, again, somewhere where I've been before in the past, which is um, yeah, hire somebody, but that that's expensive. I mean, that, that can be, that doesn't have to be, but like certain times, Certain yeah, certain things you need to get done can be expensive, um, um, and and then they sort of stack up because it's not three things; it's really twenty twenty five things you need to get yeah. done. And yeah. so so I, I I feel this this is my cue to tell folks that if you could find the thing that sort of got me out of that purgatory, I realized what I needed, and I but but I didn't quite have the funds to get the help that I needed is scalability mm -hmm. get getting some scalability and for me and just advice to you folks is if you can produce if you can get it together and produce just this like some just a couple mini courses just your first chance to get some mini courses and yep. start and small start small and drop it into a marketplace or something like that right that's what mm -hmm. sort of broke me free was yep. And, and getting, yeah, some getting, getting some income from putting up a Udemy course and getting traffic and building your list and like the whole engine that you teach, teach people in your process. It's like, and by the way, for those who are watching this live or in the future, Robert's Udemy engine is insane. I had never seen that model before until I started working with them. It's nuts. I, and so I, and I haven't seen anybody else teaching people to build that either. So it's a, it's a unique, it's a lumpy engine. Like <laughs> it's amazing. So I was super excited because I, I geek out about business models and like, I love engines where there's yeah. a thing out here for free or low cost and it, and it brings people over here to this site and then they get this thing, which is another free thing. And then like, Oh, Hey, you've got more over here. I should buy this other thing. Cause it's amazing. And your other stuff was, you know, the $20 course was amazing. So I should buy the $200 course. And like, that whole funnel is just, it's nuts. So anyway, just wanted to plug your, that bit of your work that you do. 
Uh, thank you. That means a lot coming from you. I really appreciate it. It's uh, and it's so we've given it a name. It's become a thing. We've got a name. We what do you call it? It's 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 literally on our website. It's it's part of our implementation, our phase three. It's it's one of the steps in phase three. Not everybody does it, but I recommend it every time, especially if somebody has a good idea. Do you call it the Lunty engine? <laughs> no. Come not on, that. man. No. No. No, no, you're gonna no. We call it platform funneling. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Platform funneling. And guess what? Guess uh, um, Jeff Cobb and I did a show just like this that was only about platform funneling. He thought oh, it was cool. clever too. So I'm flattered. I'm flattered folks that people like Jeff Cobb who's another really like icon in the industry and, and Forrest so sort of recognize this clever idea. <laughs> but yeah, it, we're helping clients do that. So, so basically it's just uh, creating a small mini course and using that as a means to get some revenue, but also to get traffic. It's a, it's a, it's a it's it's it, it's a double. It's two for one. You get revenue and you get traffic to your website, so yep. you can start getting that leverage to yeah hire a VA that sort of thing. So yep. Thank you for bringing that up, but it is it's good advice for folks. Yeah, that's cool. All right, this is great. How you doing? I'm you good. Doing? Yep. You feeling up? You feeling good? Okay. I'm ready to keep going, man. Yep. I, I I like I like your um I like your sort like your retro old school fifties cowboy shirt. It's pretty cool. <laughs> I put on a button-up shirt for you, Robert. <laughs> you know, I almost always wear t-shirts, but for you, I pulled out the button-up shirt. <laughs> well, based on our based on our, our tech check this morning, I take my shirt off for you. Baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, that was funny. Because <laughs> I was like wiring up uh, on the lab, and I and I my camera was on. Okay, too much information. Here we go. Next question. Right. Next question. One of the things that's really super cool, as you've already seen from from forest and why i tell lots of people for us when you're not around I, I have mentors i have a few mentors you're one of them oh learned thanks a i learned a lot about this business from you and a lot about life from you honestly i did uh, which i'm very grateful for so um let's pivot and talk about some of these inspiration stuff um share with us your i call it your hero story or your rags to riches story and i i've, I've had a few glimpses of it but from what I heard, at one point in your life, you used to live in a teepee. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, here we go. <laughs> yeah, there was so, a teepee phase. Like, like you're super successful and you've dialed all this in and, and people that want to do courses are watching. You're like, wow, this guy's there. But the thing is, is it hasn't always been this way, right? No. So no. What's, how'd you go from teepee to Tessa, please? Yeah. Oh boy. I had to condense this story because there's a, you know, if I condense it, it's going to make it sound like it happened within a, like a time frame of about four years, but it's much longer than that. Like, yeah. okay. I was in the TP <laughs> back in like 1997, 98, early 2000, somewhere in there. I went through a phase of my life where I was discovering spirituality and, you know, different kinds of spiritual practices. And I also discovered music at the same time. So I was really into, um, the didgeridoo and Aboriginal culture, as well as Native American music, and got into a community where we were doing sweat lodges and sun dances and drum dances and all that. I became the the song holder for the sweat lodge community, so I was the one singing in the sweat lodge and stuff and drumming and all that, and just really got into it. Moved into a teepee and just like I just went through an uncomfortable phase where I got so deep into Native American culture and studying with Native American shamans that I like, I wanted to become a Native American, as silly as that sounds from where I'm sitting right now. But, um, and I still have a deep connection with that community, but now it comes out differently. Like I wanna help them as much as I can. And that's a whole other story. But, um, so I, I sold everything I owned, which included a very expensive, like one of the very first full suspension mountain bikes when they first came out, I bought one for like three or $4,000, had that for a while and then sold it. And then that was the main thing that allowed me to buy the TP. I just gave everything I owned away. Like I just, possessions were gone. You can't fit much in a TP anyway. So put it up, uh, up in the mountains of Boulder in a little town called Gold Hill and uh, proceeded to struggle. <laughs> living living at um, 8,500 feet through a winter in a teepee, not a smart idea. 
like no running water, no electricity, and you're living in a tent basically. And the winds get intense up there. Like the, the jet stream just sits on top of Gold Hill in the winter, right? So I'm freezing my ass off with a foot of blankets on top of me. I wake up in the morning, there's icicles hanging down off the blankets from my breath that turns into icicles. It's, it was nuts. The, the bottom line of this part of the story where I began was that I was living on $7,000 a year. That's below poverty level. So um, it was hard and I was struggling. I didn't know how to make money. That's where it came from. I was in a period where like, it appealed to me to be uh, an Australian Aboriginal, just to be able to live off the land. And so I learned survival skills. I learned Native American survival skills. And you could basically drop me in the woods with a knife and I'd be fine. I could hunt animals, trap them, turn their skin into clothing, turn skins into structures. I could build you know, structures out of wood and leaves, like all this stuff. I wanted to get off the grid, right? And I, because I didn't know how to make money, right? And this is okay. where I was going. Great. This is awesome. I, sorry to interrupt <laughs> you. But you're going to continue on with this, but are you telling us, because seven grand, you can't do anything with it. You no. You went out and hunted your own food. No, I, I learned how to do it. I'm not going to say that I actually did it. I did, I did turn some um, deer hide into clothing, which I still have. It's a very time intensive process to make deer skin. Um, but yeah, I know how to make clothing out of deer skin and it's, it's hard and it takes a long time, but it's possible and it's really cool. It's very soft, but did, 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 did you have a pet bear named, named Ben? No, <laughs> I was pretty much that. That's kind of where I wanted to go is like off the grid in the cabin. That would have been great. It would have more insulation, but, um, and a, and a wood burning stove. So that's, this is the scene of where I began and I don't want to like, I'm not going to spend as much time going through all the intermediary steps. Okay. We'll go faster, but I wanted to paint the picture because um, this is a journey that a lot of people take, not the TP part, but the from to journey. You're in a place now and you want to get to this other place. Well, the from for me was struggling to survive on $7,000 a year. And I was making that money by, by selling didgeridoos. I would go out and harvest aspen trees that have a, a particular kind of fungus that makes the middle of the tree soft so I could hollow them out and make aboriginal didgeridoos out of local aspen trees. And I sold them and I busked on the mall by playing music, put a hat out. So I busked and I sold didgeridoos. That was how I made that $7,000 a year, which is not much. I mean, like I'd burn through that in a couple of weeks right now with our current family burn rate. But um, so I was never taught how to make money growing up. And I just got tossed out into the wild after being on a ski team and um, got off the ski team from a bad ski accident and didn't know what to do and went to college, studied what I want to study and fell in love with learning. And then I graduated myself because I discovered music, right? And I wanted to chase after the music. So after four years of college and different colleges and, and no degree yet, no bachelor's degree, I ejected myself and then went into the TP, right? So that was what happened in that phase. But I still didn't know how to make money. And the crux of this comes down to there were there were moments where I was like driving around town in my 1974 orange Volkswagen bus which I loved, <laughs> um, looking for a job, right? And I'd come home at night, couldn't find anything. And I would like, I would, I remember very clearly crumpling on the floor of the teepee and just like, I just lost it. And I just started crying like uncontrollably. And I was like, I was out in the woods and nobody could hear me. So I was like, like just kind of like cry screaming, like there has to be another way. How do I make money? there has to be another way. Like, this is too hard. I don't understand. Right. So that's, that was like, that was one of those moments where I hit bottom really hard. And, um, that wasn't the only time that I hit like that. There was probably two or three times where I crashed. It was either on the floor of the teepee, the floor of a cabin that I upgraded to with no running water and no electricity, but it was warmer than the teepee or the floor of my kitchen somewhere. Like it's happened two or three times back in that phase. And, I went from, you know, manual labor job working on construction sites to manual labor job digging ditches to manual labor job where I show up on the first day and my job is to get a shovel and finish burying a dead horse. Literally, the first thing I did on that farm 
was to bury a very large dead horse. Crazy, right? But that's how I, the only way I can make money was with my muscles. And all the time while I'm building houses, digging ditches, pulling weeds, like all these jobs, like using my physical body, all I wanted, was, I, and I always phrase it in my head, like I want a sit down job. I just want to sit down. You're on a construction site, you get reprimanded for sitting down. It's not okay in that culture. I remember like building an Adobe house and I was sitting down to twist the ties for the concrete forms for the foundation. And the, the concrete contractor didn't know me, and but I was helping him for the day. He yelled at me because I sat down for two minutes to twist ties instead of squat down to do it. So they don't appreciate that at all because it makes you look lazy. But I wanted a sit down job. I wanted to use my mind. I knew that I had capacity. And um, so I went from all these manual labor jobs to I've, I read some books by a philosopher named Ken Wilber multiple times. And I became like really well versed in his theory. And long story short, I eventually got hired by his institute. It was called the Integral Institute. I think they're still around. Um, and I became one of his. Uh, I became like his uh, associate editor of his academic journal. It was my very first job making money from using my mind. And I was in heaven, even though I was making eleven bucks an hour. Like so happy to be sitting in an office chair, at a computer, working with knowledge and concepts. I became one of his top students and then I got hired by a tech startup who wanted to use his theory to implement it into their virtual reality user interface that pulled me into the tech industry from the tech industry. I figured out how to build websites. We got, um, we got pregnant, moved back to Boulder. I needed a way to make money, started my very first business building websites on Joomla, then transitioned to WordPress. So I was like a freelancer building WordPress websites. And I was like, you know what? Like, I could make more money by teaching how people how to do this rather than implementing the websites, like building them myself, right? Got hired by a company that sold themes for Joomla to create a university. That was my very first online course. I made like a couple hundred thousand dollars in the first year. That wasn't all for me. I ran the thing by myself, my own little department. They had a crap ton of traffic coming in. So that was like, you put those two things together, lots of traffic and a really good course. And someone who's knowledgeable and taking care of people that made good money. After a while, I was like, you know, I'm giving this company most of the profits when I'm doing everything myself to teach this course. Why should I just go create my own course? So I did. I left them, created um, Tech Husband, focusing on women entrepreneurs who are having trouble solving the technology problem and building a platform to sell online courses. I'd been studying this was around 2007. Um, 2012 period where online courses were becoming the thing and it really started to take off, but the platforms were difficult to work with back then. You know, Kajabi started in 2007 and their first version was, you know, limited and it didn't do much and it was harder to use. So there was still always this combination of WordPress and MailChimp and Kajabi mm -hmm. uh, or just like, you know, 25 different plugins on WordPress and people were confused and I saw them struggling with it. I'm like, I can help you guys. And I was really passionate about helping women entrepreneurs. So I created this thing called Tech Husband, created a, a course to teach them how to build the entire platform, step-by-step -step video tutorials, how to build a WordPress site, how to use MailChimp, how to use a plugin to, to sell online courses, how to handle all the payment processing. It was a very manual process, but it was the it was the duct tape model where you use WordPress and you tie things to it. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. You get yeah. this kind of monster at the end that doesn't always function very well. Indeed, been there, yep. yeah. So, um, that's, that's where I got started with the online course stuff. And then over a while, um, over a period of time, I started getting more guys coming with the, with the business branded as tech husband. It got a little uncomfortable because they were, a lot of them were cracking jokes. So they're like, so we're going to go on a date now. Like, <laughs> like, no, 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 no. It's just, it's just my branding and whatever. Like, um, so I had to change the business name, which is what clarity lab came from. Okay. And, um, and then started focusing on doing software reviews, started getting a lot of success with affiliate revenue, um, consulting and affiliate revenue, software reviews, um, had online courses throughout there, still have the Kajabi course up, which is on my site now. Um, yeah. Link will drop a link to that later on, but and we can talk about that later. But um, yeah, and so that's, that's, and the affiliate revenue is what led to the Tesla. Kajabi has a very generous, gamified level plan where 
the more referrals you bring them, the bigger the prizes get. And at some certain level, they give you a car. So, you know, it's not like they, a car just shows up at your house. You have to go buy it and then they, they pay for the monthly payment. So, yeah, um, I mean, but still like, so I'm, I'm telling you, man, like, let me just connect the, the from and the two. To this day, when I walk up to the garage and I see the Tesla, every time I get in it, I'm like, oh my God, I did this. And I connect, if I think back to where I was when I crashed on the floor in the TP, just in a, like a ball of tears of like, there has to be another way, right? That is the full journey of like, oh my God, like I'm now helping people sell their knowledge. And I did this, I did this thing. And now there's this car here, like my dream car, right? And I'm not a big flashy guy and I don't, I'm not aiming car. towards a, a Lamborghini. I just like, it's, yeah. this is the most amazing car I've ever yeah. owned. And I've wanted to have an electric car since I was 10 years old like dreaming of having an electric car plugged into solar panels before that was even a thing. So I finally did it. And like, I'm stunned because I'm like inside, I'm still that guy who loves native American culture and doesn't know how to make money. Like there's that, that's still part of me. That's part of my past. Um, so that, that was the arc of my journey. I don't know if I want to, I don't feel comfortable calling it a hero's journey because I don't see myself as a hero, but like, you know, if you look at Joseph Campbell's hero's journey structure, it does follow similar, a similar pattern. Like I, I went through all the phases and I'm in the phase now where I'm kind of coming back to the world and, and bringing the, the gifts of knowledge that I gained on my challenges, you know? Um, so that's where I am. I'll pause there. Cause it, there might be some questions or <laughs> like, I'll just let you take that in and I'm talking a lot. So <laughs> like that's all real. Yeah, it's very real. Real. And that is an amazing story. It's so inspiring and in, in many ways. And I, I, I made a note down here. You mentioned the spontaneous crying. Yeah. And my jaw dropped. If you watch the video, it's like, I've never told anybody this, but that happened to me one time. And it was so weird and so odd because I don't know where it came from. Yeah. But but I never forget, and it's my opportunity to share with, with friends, which is I was Robert from the Vocal Age studio. I was down at a studio in downtown Seattle. I was pulling out. I was down there like 6 a.m. in the morning, pulling mm -hmm. out the PA system, plugging it in, very laborious, setting it all up to do eight hours of uh, voice coaching. And I was in this theater, and, I, and it, I'll never forget. All of a sudden, I just started sobbing. Yeah. And crying. Just, uh, and I it didn't come from, I wasn't thinking a, th a sad thought. It was it totally bubbled oh, yeah. up. It bubbled up from the subconscious. And I just, and I didn't understand it that tears, sobbing, looking back, I think it was a subconscious awareness that something wasn't right or something's mm. not going in the right direction, but not at a conscious level. Yeah. It, that happened to me once. Yeah. Or it's just a, like so much stress yeah. builds up over time and, yeah. and you know, we're good at stuffing it down and it just comes out sideways or you just can't control it. Like it, you know, you probably hit a wall like I did. It just got too hard and you can, there's, you need a, like a release valve. So yeah. You are awesome. This is why, <laughs> this is why I won't let you get rid of me. Um, <laughs> and I, and I'm proud well, to thanks call for you. sharing that. I, I appreciate you sharing that. You know, if you haven't said that out loud before, that's a, that's a big deal. You know, it's vulnerable to talk about these moments, but they're real and you hit bottom sometimes, yeah. you know, and there, that wasn't the only time. And, and even after I got into the online course industry, uh, there were still moments where I would crumple on, I don't know why it's always the kitchen floor, man, but like in the middle of a launch, I just like either lean on the counter and I'm like, I just can't take it anymore. And what I can't take is there's a, there's a stress that happens in launching online courses. Even if you have five, six, seven successful launches in your past where you've done multiple six figures or you bring in half a million dollars, like, you know, we've done that multiple times. And then you go into another launch. When you're in the launch, you can't see the future. When you plan the launch, you think it's going to go fine because you can look at the past launches and you're like, oh, yeah, we're, we're fine. There's a spike at the beginning and it sort of levels off in the middle slows down and there's a big spike at the end because the urgency that comes at the end of a launch. 
But what you don't remember is when you're planning, when you get into the launch and you're in the middle, you cannot see what's coming and you have no idea if the pattern will repeat in the past that ended up okay. When you hit a day of your launch, you're like, you know, two sales come in, the next day one sale comes in, the next day no sales happen. And you're like, oh my God, we need to bring in another $150,000 to make it for the rest of the year because our family makes the entire year's income in these two weeks, right? That's a lot of stress. That's a lot and, of stress. And when you're in the middle of it and you're launching and you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, you don't know if there's going to be a spike, you don't know if like California is going to get swallowed up by fires again and affect your sales because most of your customers are in California. I'm not making that up. That actually happens multiple times. Like uncontrollable worldwide events or political things in the country that you're in or an election happens that you didn't plan for. Things affect your launch and, and it can like it doesn't always turn out good. There's not always a big enough spike at the end. So I like I'm just saying that like you don't just crumple and hit the stress point once and then you're like you're golden and like, oh yeah, yay, I made six figures and like we're golden now. It's all passive income. Well, that's crap. Like yeah, that's true. Passive yeah. income doesn't exist. Passive yeah. income takes a lot of work to make it. <laughs> Like, I, Jesus. Say that once. I never forgot it. You, you told me that in another conversation on the phone. It is because yeah, people will say, whoa, whoa, passive income. I wanted to. And then it, they say that to you. I've heard it, I suppose, on a few occasions. And your yeah. response is dead on. It's like, yeah, there's no such thing as passive income, no. really. Because I mean, you can build up a model where you go to sleep and wake up with money. But to get it to get that engine up and running takes a massive amount of work. And you have to have yeah. a team to keep the engine running so that you can go to sleep and wake up with sales happening. But, um, yep. okay. I want right. to be aware of time here. Cause that was a bit of a long story. So uh, go for okay. it. it was all worth it. We have a, a little more, a few more things we want to do here. Um, this is great. I wish we could keep going. Um, all right. So try to keep it snappy. Um, what are three things you've learned about course production in your consulting engagements? I think maybe you should, you've hit on that a couple of times, but we'll ask you to repeat yourself if, if necessary. What are three things you've learned about course production in your consulting engagements you think would help others who are interested in gaining scalability right. and freedom? I think the biggest, like the biggest thing off the top of my head is... Okay. Um, One. You have to overlap... And I'm going to draw a Venn diagram with words, but imagine a Venn diagram with multiple circles to find the thing in the middle. You have to line up what you want to do with what you're good at, a problem that people have that you can solve, and a problem that's big enough that those people will be willing to spend money on it. If you don't align those four circles and find the thing in the middle, you will struggle. If you get three of them overlap, but not the fourth one, you'll struggle. You know, get part of the way and then it'll kind of work and you get a little bit of success, but you're missing that other circle. It doesn't matter which one it is. You have to line those things up. And then in the part of the process of doing that, 30 or 40 minutes ago, I said, I'm going to come back to this thing. And that thing that I wanted to come back to is that I said that most everybody starts out by like, oh, I've got a course idea. I'm going to buy a URL. Oh, and I need a tech platform. I want a website thingy, right? Like, I need some thingy to process credit cards and put my course up, right? And I need videos. They're thinking tech piece first, which is, uh, you know, it's pretty obvious because you can't get very far with an online business without an online presence and a tech system to make it all run. There is a step before that, before you start building that and spending money on software that almost everyone skips. You have to go out and talk to people in your chosen market, tell them what you're thinking of building and see if they're willing to spend money on the thing that you're about to spend nine months on to build and launch. Most people skip that step. It's the validation phase where you validate your idea before you spend money and time building the thing. So that that's part of that Venn diagram is lining up what you can do with what you're good at with you know a problem in the market space and, and are they willing to spend money on it? That last thing, are they willing to spend money to solve the problem is what I'm talking about here is, is you have to validate that they are willing to spend money on your online course to solve the problem that you're going to help them with in the course. So that's that's a big thing that I didn't know when I started. And you know, I got lucky sometimes because I kind of backed into it and had some success. But uh, a lot, of, I've seen a lot of people spend nine, twelve months building an online course, creating their course content, doing the videos, building the tech platform, doing the copywriting, on and on and on, everything you got to do. And then they launch. They do a whole product launch formula thing in two weeks big event they launch things 
and they're trying to sell their two thousand dollar course and one person signs up and it, and it completely flops and they're crushed and like i've seen that happen multiple times in mastermind groups i've been in it's not pleasant and i try to help people in my consulting like that is the thing i'm trying to help them avoid get them over to the good place and help them avoid the bad things super basic what are the circles, what are the circles again what can you do what do what? you want to do okay what yeah. are you good at those things aren't always the same right like i'm good at copywriting but it's not something i want to do i did some copywriting for you but that was like a secret behind the scenes thing that's not a secret now because i'm saying it here but like <laughs> i don't offer copywriting robert got some from me because he was you know special guy i like him and he needed it so um so that's something I can do and I'm good at it, but I don't want to offer it. So what do you want to do? What are you good at? What do you, uh, people have a problem with that you can solve? And then what are they willing to pay money for? Because they might have a problem that they want to get solved, but they may not be willing to spend the amount of money that you're about to charge for it. Or they may want, want to spend money on this kind of help in the format that you're about to deliver it in. Maybe it's a completely self-paced course with no interaction with the instructor and no social community. They may not want to spend two thousand dollars on that, or a thousand, or even five hundred. But if you add in weekly calls and it's a six-week group and you're teaching live, like we talked about earlier, and then you have a you know asynchronous community forum where you can get a little bit of support and meet other people like you who are solving the same kind of problem, now you've got a thing that people are more willing to spend money on. But will they spend the amount of money you're about to charge? You have to test that. So that's those are the circles. Um, Second thing we touched on is um, building a team. Can't do this alone. Don't need to hammer that one because I already like nailed that one down. Um, I think the last one, after doing, I think I've done like 550 calls, consulting calls over the last three years with a lot of people. Um, when I get new folks in and we start working on their plan to build a business, almost inevitably no one really understands the importance of copywriting <laughs> like it's and it's understandable like you, if you're not a copywriter a conversion copywriter which is writing words that get people to take an action on your website to sign up for a free thing or to buy your course or sign up for a webinar whatever it is if you don't have the right words to resonate with the people in your market to get them to take an action the whole thing will fail it's a linchpin of the entire model so if you take one thing away, aside from the fact that I used to live in a teepee, which will probably be implanted in your brain <laughs> because it's visual, but like the copywriting, the importance of copywriting is so crucial. And a lot of people don't know that it that it's as important as it is. As it is. For, for most people, yeah, building a story band. I tell every single client who doesn't know about copywriting, if you need to learn a little bit yourself, Go get that book. It's twelve dollars. Go through it in a weekend. Do the exercise. Create the story brand script. It is by far the least expensive way to get very concise, clear words on your homepage of your website. Hands down, the best I've ever seen. From there, it's go buy a thousand or two thousand dollar copywriting course, and there's not much in between. So, and that's the DIY path. It's either the DIY path with that book, or his second book, Marketing Made Simple, or hire a, a certified story brand consultant like yourself to walk you through the story brand script um, or you go hire someone that, like I said earlier, these are your two main choices. You learn to do it yourself or you go hire someone to do it for you with the copywriting. I really suggest like it's a, it's a very difficult skill to learn and it takes years to get good at it. To write, to identify who you're selling to, to get inside of their head and like um, understand what first person language they use to think about the problem that you're trying to solve. Yeah. And then you use those words and spit it back to them so that they feel like, oh my God, this Course Creek site, like, whoa, Robert is my guy. Like this team, they are speaking my language. You want them to feel that you're speaking their language. To do that is very hard. You have to literally crawl inside of their heads and figure out how they think about problems and the words that they use, right? So I can't. I can't emphasize the copywriting bit enough. All you have between you and your office and some somebody in Ohio who's thinking about buying your website, uh, buying your course, there's words, whether it's in a video, mm -hmm. a podcast, mm -hmm. or written copy on a sales page, or a blog post, or an email. All you've got, it's all words. It's strings of words. Like if you look at this from a um, first principles perspective and like bust this down to the atomic level, 
What does it take to sell online courses? You have to communicate to people in your market with words. No way around it. So you have to use the right words to get people to say yes and to realize that you have something of value to, to communicate to them. And then they, once they realize that they know you and they like you and they trust you and you have knowledge, you're, you're good. And they'll say yes, right? So that's the big challenge. I think those are the three things. Yeah? That's great. All right. So we've got one more thing. I can't believe we actually coming in on time. I know. Uh, it feels longer. <laughs> I know. Like I went into the past for a while. And I was like, whoa, I'm in that's, a CPU. <laughs> well, I think that, no. I mean, I think that's part of, I think that's evident of the quality of our discussion with you today. It's just super cool. All right. So here comes sort of a fun part. Um, and, um, Thank you for all of that, by the way, in the past, today, and in the future. Like I said, I'm not going to let you get rid of me. <laughs> um, I'm not going anywhere. You better not. All right. So um, we like to do something at the end of the show where you look to the camera, look eyes to the camera, speak to somebody who's inspired by you from watching this, and give them more, if you would please, in a snappy way, sage advice. Um, I will read how I wrote this out. Look to the camera and share some sage words of wisdom to your listeners in two minutes. A profound lesson or advice you hope they will always remember from viewing this interview today with Forrest Linden. All right. Uh What's coming is some principles that kind of guide my decision making in business. And I think these are pretty applicable to any kind of business, but because I tend to focus on people selling knowledge, then, you know, I help people apply these there. Be authentic and transparent. It's kind of like I was doing earlier with my story about being in the TP and the telling you about when I crashed and hit the floor and like that was the bottom for me. People want, authenticity uh, like the more we move towards digital everything and zoom calls and the pandemic and like people want to feel connected to you so be real and just be yourself and don't be afraid to do it um another big one is i i use this philosophy in every single decision i make with business help first sell later is the short version of it because it's easy to remember and what that philosophy is, is like you putting people's need to solve a problem above your need to make money with everything you do. It's this position of coming at everything with compassion and first seeking to help people with their problems. And if you do that, you will never be short on business. You'll never be short on customers. And I know it seems odd to like come at this from like give and give and give and then don't charge until a little bit later. But what you're doing is you're building up trust and you're helping people for free over and over and over. Just like I'm showing up here and helping whoever's watching this for free, right? I'm not making any money from this. I'm helping. Eventually, maybe somebody comes back around and finds my website in a few months and signs up for consulting services and I might make some money. But that's not why I'm showing up here. I'm showing up because I want to help. I want to help you, Robert, because we're friends. I like you. I want to help your audience. I want to help Course Creek. Everything I do is like, I get a, I get an invite to do an interview. Should I do this? Well, can I help people? I will only show up if I can help people, right? And then secondarily, it does have to be connected to making money at some point. Otherwise, I can't keep helping people for free. So it's not like always be altruistic to the point of not charging. Yeah. It's be as altruistic and helpful as you can and then wait to make the sale instead of flipping it around which is what most people do is like hey how's it going i'm forrest buy my stuff right no that doesn't work so well and people don't like to be sold on be aware that the journey of building a business like this is going to be harder and it's going to take longer than you expect and it's going to cost probably twice as much as you think it will it's just like building a house it's harder it takes longer and it costs more than you think just expect that to come and you will have an easier time making it through the hard parts. Um, I think the last thing is just be committed to like maintaining the integrity of your business to the point where you're willing to say no 
to working with the wrong kind of client or customer. Just to make boundaries around your business, treat it as an entity, as, a, as like a person, and be willing to say no. In the beginning, it's going to be hard because you want to say yes to everything because you want to make money because you need to make money. But if you work with the wrong kind of people who don't fit your values or the, the, the values of your business, you will end up not being happy and you will eventually probably have to terminate a relationship that doesn't go well. So, um, yeah, I think those are some pithy things. Did I do it in two minutes? I don't know. Might have gone a little over. <laughs> Just, I don't think so, but it's okay. We'll take it. Wow. I, <clears throat> that might have been my best little interview. Well, it is. I just, I have to say that was the best interview we've had so far in our little show. Uh, Happy to have been part of it. Um, really. It's an honor. <laughs> thank you. You are. You just fantastic. Okay. So folks, I hope you got some, something out of that. I'm sure you did. Um, go back and watch it again, get a pen and paper and write this down uh, throughout this broadcast you guys may have noticed i was going down there it's not that i'm disinterested i'm literally taking notes from what this man has to say <laughs> that's not a compliment it's true it's all right here okay so i mean this is valuable valuable stuff and um thank you thank you for us thank you for opening your Thanks heart for me here valuable time this morning and um with that we are going to say goodbye and um uh i'm robert from course creek and this is uh, Forrest from uh, Clarity Lab, and um, we're here to help you guys. Thanks, you guys. Any questions? Bye. Awesome.